So first of all, I want to thank Emily for organizing this session because I think it's, it's really risky. So as she said, not many people usually want to discuss some kinds of issues, so thanks very much for organizing it. And second, I have to apologize because, well, it's obvious that English is not my uh, mother language. And doing something like this, with these 20 seconds for each slide, in a language that is not your language, is even more challenging than it is from the beginning. So I apologize for that. I decided to read the different slides. I hope that in doing this, I can choose more the words. So hopefully, so it's not going to be so boring, hopefully, because it's 20 seconds, so you are going, I'm not going to have time to be bored at all. Well. Anyway, academic feminism initiated the process of acknowledging that women were underrepresented both in the historical discourse and in academia. Observing that this double underrepresentation is still a matter of fact in, in ancient Near Eastern studies, here I aim to show you that the visibility and the portrayal both of women in archaeology and of the archaeology of women is interdependent. I defend that analyzing the situation of women's studies and gender studies in the field of ancient Eastern studies may help to determine why women scholars are still underrepresented in our discipline. And to prove it in this communication, I will develop a SWOT analysis to better fit my reflections in the challenging format of this, of this session. So let's begin with the strengths. First strength is, is that during the 80s and the 90s, the visibility both of women in archaeology and of the archaeology of women increased notably. As regards the first point, women were present in large numbers in many archaeological digs, and some even led the missions. This is the case of Rashambra, directed by Marguerite John, Telvia by Eva Strominger, or Telafis, led by professors Mazzoni and Cecchini. However, more frequent was the participation of women as co-directors and not as only directors, and was relatively common when they were working together with their husbands. For example, Giorgio Buccellati and Marilyn Kelly Buccellati at Tel Mozan, or David and John Oates at Tel Brac. A second strength is the good health of the archaeology of women as witnessed through publications. In this direction, volumes such as Gender Through Time in the Ancient Near East, edited by Diane Bolger, and The World of Women in the Ancient and Classical Near East, edited by Beth Albert Nakai, both published in 2008, or the most recent uh, Near Eastern journal, especially issue devoted to gender, published in 2016, have to be highlighted. Moving on to the witnesses, unfortunately, many publications, despite this is not the case of the publications just quoted before, just act women and steer, while gender archaeology, which by the way had a very limited influence in ancient Near Eastern studies, aspires to introduce changes in epistemology, not merely to add new data or new case studies. A second weakness is what some scholars identified as a trend to decrease of publications dealing with gender in ancient Near Eastern studies in the last 15 years. Despite it may be contested with some of the evidence I show you here, I agree it is not a good symptom that we lack a specialized journal. NIN, Journal of Gender Studies in Antiquity, the only one in the discipline, had a short lifespan with only four issues from 2000 to 2004. Moving now to women as authors, a third weakness is that, as was noticed by Diane Bolger in her 2008 paper, Gender Fields in Near Eastern Archaeology, and I quote, women continue to lag behind men in all areas of archaeological publication, but particularly in the publication of excavation and survey reports, general reports and textual reports, end of quote. Also in this direction, a fourth weakness is that few women are authors of handbooks of history of the ancient Near East. From a sample of 16 handbooks we have here, published from the 60s, taking as first case study the seminal work of Oppenheim, Ancient Mesopotamia, only four out of 16 were authored by women. In other words, only 25% of these handbooks were written by women. So the ratio of male-female scholars is clearly unbalanced, what means, from my point of view, lower possibilities for women scholars to be influential, both in the field of study and outside it as these reference works are synthesis of several trends and research results, and at the same time, they themselves are trendsetters. Moving on to the opportunities, I think the increase of archaeology of women is witnessed by the organization of conferences and workshops devoted to this topic. As these events often facilitate the increase, at the turn, of publications and interest on the issue, I think they are good opportunities to promote the interest on women in past and in present times. Let me mention some of these events. 
First, in three occasions, the annual conference of acidiology, the Rencontre Acidiologique International, had as main topic women, sex, or gender. Second, in the US, Beth Alpernahai launched a session especially devoted to women and gender issues, present each year at the ASOR annual meeting. Third, since 2013, Sanas Svart and myself organized several workshops and conferences devoted to gender, methodology, and the ancient Near East. And the next one will be held February 2017 in Barcelona. A second opportunity linked to this first one is the creation of forums of debate and tools to maximize networking among women scholars. With this goal, Albert Nakai launched the ASOR initiative on the status of women and its mentoring launch. And also interesting is the recent launching on a, of a collaborative platform by Vanessa Julo for scholars studying gender or agency. A third opportunity may be to take advantage of the policies of positive discrimination, which are not being implemented in several universities. As I defended so far, increasing the visibility and the number of women researchers and women archaeologists is likely to increase the visibility of women in the past. And I'm here defending that both the attention paid to women in the past and in the present are closely interconnected. A fourth and last opportunity I want to mention here is that the fact that gender studies entered the disciplinary mainstream in many universities in the last years has a potentially positive effect if it means a real attempt to counteract the common ghettoism of women's studies and gender studies. However, and with this I move to the threats, there is also potentially negative effect of this entering the disciplinary mainstream. As underrepresentation of both women in archaeology and the archaeology of women in ancient Near Eastern studies is still a fact, preventing gender studies from melting into the mainstream may be useful in order to keep this underrepresentation from being made invisible before it has been clearly defined and counteracted. A second threat is the perpetuation of certain networking dynamics which tend to exclude or at least minimize the presence of women scholars in lectures, conferences and publications. As noticed by Diane Borger in her 2008 paper mentioned before, and I quote, men still appear to far better than women in situations where participation is by invitation. However, despite I think networking is fundamental, and I also showed you some examples of networking lodged by women as opportunities, we also have to take into account that there is a danger of considering women in ancient and Eastern studies as a compact group, distinct from men in the same discipline. Ignoring this danger may lead us to essentialize and standardize women scholars, something we also want to avoid as feminist researchers. So here we have a big contradiction. To sum up in this short analysis, I showed you two strengths linked to the increase from the 80s and the 90s of women in archaeology and of the archaeology of women. I also showed you four weaknesses linked to publications, mainly to their content, specialization and authorship. And finally, I uh, summarized four opportunities and three threats dealing both mainly with networking and with the entering of women and gender studies in the disciplinary mainstream. As I showed you uh, that some of these trends and opportunities present also a phase which may be interpreted as a potential weakness or a potential threat, I am aware I offered more questions than answers and I apologize for that. However, I hope these questions together with the, with the question you can see in the slide right now may help us to follow the debate. Thanks for your attention.